Death appears to be a very private matter. In the public eye, few deaths are spoken about, saved almost entirely for celebrities and public figures. The loss of another is commonly left at the customary, I'm sorry for your loss, and mourning for such a loss is expected to happen in private. In casual conversation, bringing up the topic of death is often seen as a cause for concern. For these reasons, death appears to be a very private matter, a topic hidden from our societal and political interests. But upon the inspection and analysis presented by Ashil Mbembe, death turns out to be one of the most public matters of all, as death and the political or social power over it are found in each and every manifestation of government. In his 1976 work, The History of Sexuality, Michel Foucault established the concept of biopower, a new form of social and political control that modern forms of government can enact on populations. Rather than an old governmental right to execute, biopower represents the newfound power of governments to administer life. Through medicine, statistics, bureaucracy, and much, much more, biopower and its two poles of discipline and regulation have led to increases in life expectancy, decreases in mortality rates, and improvements in the general standard of living. Put simply, modern governments may now decide who is being taken care of by the benevolent, surveillance-driven governmentality of advanced democracies. But this implies a choice by the modern government. Some populations are chosen to be given life, and others are not. This choice reveals the inherent racism of biopower. Not necessarily racism in the sense one may commonly encounter it today, but in a broader sense, suggesting that, as some populations are chosen to receive life, others are not. This can be drawn along a variety of lines, ethnicity, class, gender, cultural, and more. But in each case, an inequality exists, whereby one group receives greater care than another. This choice for who is to be made to live occurs along the axes of value and utility. For Foucault, this biopower arose around the 17th and 18th century, usurping a far older form of power, that of death. And in this gradual overthrow, biopower hid its converse. For the populations that are administered life, death has intentionally become taboo. In another work, Society Must Be Defended, Foucault wrote that it is now not so much sex as death that is the object of taboo, and continues, it is only natural that death should now be privatized and should become the most private thing of all. My introduction suggested this and acknowledged the way in which death has been moved out of the public eye but there's further reason to believe this. These days, even war, the deadliest conduct of all, is only fought in the name of the preservation of life. Rather than focusing on the action of war, the killing that is involved, the narratives that surround it are those of freedom and the safety of citizens. Also, needless to say, public executions have fallen out of favor. The town square of today, the internet and its many websites, do their best to remove or restrict nearly all content pertaining to death. Even capital punishment, which has long been the highest form of governmental punishment, has become a matter of controversy and is evermore being abolished. Modern democratic nations do all these things because they have chosen life for these populations over death. So long as they have an obedient population that is being properly instrumentalized through biopower, there is no need to bring death into the equation. Furthermore, those who are moved to the realm of death can no longer be instrumentalized. Hence, because death is outside the power relationship, power no longer recognizes death. Power literally ignores death. This may well be the case, that much of power today ignores death, but on at least one account, this isn't the full picture. For biopower and necropower, or the power of death, are inseparably intertwined. As Puar states, the latter makes its presence known at the limits and through the excess of the former. The former masks the multiplicity of its relationships to death and killing in order to enable the proliferation of the latter. But what exactly is this power of death and what does it look like? In 2003, Ashil Mbembe wrote an essay titled 
Necropolitics, wherein he established the importance surrounding the power of death. Foucault's account, that of the power of life, is necessary, but not complete. What Foucault's biopower left out was what Mbembe intended to explore, namely the subjugation of life to the power of death. Despite being a new term, necropolitics and the power of death has had a long history. In fact, it was a sovereign power to let live and make die that biopower and its ability to make live and let die usurped. As Mbembe began his essay, the ultimate expression of sovereignty resides, to a large degree, in the power and the capacity to dictate who may live and who must die. What this encompasses, and what Foucault left out, is the multiplicity of manifestations of necropower and its modern incarnations, even in the nation of democracy. Initially, the necropolitical may be said to have to do with a sovereign's right to kill. Its alternative name, the right of the sword, indicates its origins. As one of the oldest exercises of power, it is with the right of the sword that the powerful can choose to cut down or to let live. In times of old, this would be the execution of foreign armies or local political enemies. The one who held the right of the sword, who could damn anyone to death, was the sovereign. In more recent times, the right of the sword has been sheathed to an extent. There are still many examples whereby the right to kill is exercised today. Capital punishment may have fallen out of favor, but many members of a vast network of surveilling officers are quick to sentence individuals to death in a nation like the United States. Furthermore, warfare is still being waged, despite being under a different name. And war is, after all, a means of achieving sovereignty as much as a way of exercising the right to kill. In war, the government extends its swords, or in this case, guns, bombs, and drones, beyond its borders. And ultimately, as Foucault had said, desirable populations maintained by the wealthy state are not those put to death. But the right to kill is only the first of many forms whereby necropower is employed. Another form of necropower, owing in part to the right to kill, is the subjugation of life to the fear of death. Wielding the right of the sword, governments should like to coerce populations into obedience by instilling within them the fear of death. As the Tao Te Ching framed it, if the people do not fear death, what use is it to use death to frighten them? Running against many philosophical or religious viewpoints, some of which I've spoken about before, the sovereign must make the people fear death. As the sovereign's greatest power is to kill, dying must be seen as the most terrible punishment one could receive. And this has been the practice of governments for centuries, with their killings only varying in the degree to which they torture the person in the process of being put to death. But it is not only the sovereign that holds the right to kill that desires for their population to fear death. For the modern biopolitical government, too, wants their population to fear death. Albeit, there is a different motive for this fear. Rather than coercing populations into being obedient, the contemporary government keeps populations from being too friendly with death. Just as they make death a taboo, they make it feared because death is that which is beyond the reach of power. Regimes can only instrumentalize that which is alive, and in the case that death is not feared, but rather accepted, or even endorsed in some circumstances, then the excuses made for this instrumentalization of peoples may risk falling through. The fear of death is another crucial aspect of the subjugation of life to the power of death. The right to kill doesn't always manifest itself in the form of a sword, gas chamber, or drone. Instead, technological advancements have brought on yet another form of necropower. Slow death, which, according to Lauren Berlant, refers to the physical wearing out of a population and the deterioration of a people in that population that is very nearly a defining condition of their existence and historical existence. Berlant explores this concept of slow death in relation to obesity in the United States. Pressed for time, hard on cash, hungry, and seeking something to brighten the day, working class individuals are disproportionately affected by the obesity crisis. The accompanying health conditions damn many to a sooner death. Such a structure imposes a slow death onto those it subjugates, and does so knowingly. Next, death in life. So long as death is defined by the negation of life, then what death is and its power depend on what life is. So what is life? One may say breath and nourishment, and in the strictest sense, this is true. There is also a broader sense of life. Take the inmate, for example. Certainly, he is alive, breathing and all. 
but we may venture to say that he isn't truly living. The inmate has lost sovereignty over his body, fully limited by social interference. Living, yet not living, the inmate occupies a place in between life and death. Imprisonment serves as one example of the many forms of what is known as death in life, or living death. Constituted of primarily two forms, often intermixed, death in life may be social or civil. Social death occurs when a person is not accepted as fully human by society, and thus thrown aside. And civil death occurs when a person loses all of their civil rights, no longer having a voice in the public sphere. So long as one is not capable of setting their own limitations, but rather has limitations on their life imposed either socially or politically, they cannot be said to be truly alive, and thus experience death in life. All of these various forms can be combined and applied in order to create death worlds, wherein people are experiencing and surrounded by death and deadening. In the worst case, this includes being exposed to the bodies of the dead, to corpses. Corpses manage to bring the world of the dead into the world of the living, confronting people with the horror of the human condition. It was no matter of cultural transmission that the burial of bodies in wooden caskets became a norm for at least Europe and China alike. One could look to the famous play Antigone and its central conflict revolving around the dead body of Antigone's brother Polynices to see the importance of burying corpses, but I'd instead like to turn east to Mengzi to quote, most likely in past ages, men did not bury their parents but simply consigned their bodies to an open ditch when they died. But some days later, passing by, they would have seen how the foxes had gnawed on the corpses and the flies sucked. Sweat would have stood on their brows as they averted their eyes. Now that sweat was not conjured up for others to see, it would have been the feelings of their inmost hearts pouring forth on their faces. Then, they would have returned to their homes to get shovels and baskets to cover the corpses over. If burying them thus was truly the right thing, then when filial sons and men of humanity bury their parents, it is certainly in accord with the Tao. To leave bodies unburied then is both to leave the dead in the world of the living and to place the living into a world of death, comprising the last form of the subjugation of life to the power of death that I'll consider here. Throughout this video, we have seen the subjugation of life to the power of death. Yet, there appears to be more to the power of death than this alone, as death can be both used by the subjugator or the subjugated. There is a long line of thought suggesting death to have an aspect beyond terror. Hegel takes the struggle and work through which death is confronted to be that which makes a human being truly a subject. The work of death is the life of spirit. Heidegger too suggests that the human's being towards death is a necessary condition to truly attain human freedom. And at times, this work of and being towards death manifests itself as self-sacrifice. Foucault had similarly suggested that suicide could manifest as a form of resistance, not left to be a sign of pathology in all cases. Foucault also argues for an aestheticization of voluntary death as part of a beautiful life. Ultimately, death, even when used to subjugate life, can be a form of freedom, for death is precisely that from and over which I have power. The division between death and freedom is blurred, as the power of death held by governments and oneself is irrevocably interwoven with the freedom of being. And Bembe finished his essay with stating what his analysis had achieved, saying, I have demonstrated that the notion of biopower is insufficient to account for contemporary forms of the subjugation of life to the power of death. Moreover, I have put forward the notion of necropolitics, or necropower, to account for the various ways in which, in our contemporary world, weapons are deployed in the interest of maximally destroying persons and creating death worlds, that is, new and unique forms of social existence in which vast populations are subjected to living conditions that confer upon them the status of the living dead. So we're brought to the final question, what is the state of necropower today? One only needs a quick Google search to find out the extensive areas in which the manifestations of the necropolitical is being studied today, but possibly of the most immediacy. Necropower may reveal itself in the midst of a global pandemic. In a short article on the topic, Christopher Lee suggested the COVID pandemic has sparked a crisis for the sovereignty of nations like the United States and the United Kingdom that have increasingly sought to privatize public health. 
Lee writes, the power to dictate who may live has been outsourced and increasingly privatized, available only to those who can afford it. Whether or not this is the case, in a time of such great death, the necropolitical deserves focus. So as death knocks on the door of nations characterized by biopower, their response may be revealing of those who are not taken care of, but rather subjugated to the power of death. Necropolitics is, of course, a far larger topic than what I've covered in this video here, so feel free to let me know anything else that you think deserves attention. But that's all I've got to talk about today. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed, feel free to leave a like and subscribe. If you thought I got anything wrong or disagreed with anything, please let me know what and why down below. And until next time.